And we like... Uh, when we open boxes, we mm. find some really kooky shaped <laughs> potatoes and we absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. We put them out on display at the farmer's markets and ask the kids, yeah. what do you think that looks like? <laughs> Welcome to the Vegalog podcast, a dialogue about the Australian vegetable industry from your peak industry body, Ausveg. I'm your host, Tom Bicknell. You may notice this podcast is a little different from those you've heard from Ausveg in the past. Vegalog is a new format for us and incorporates the existing InfoVeg radio on levy funded R&D projects with some brand new segments. We hope you like the New Look podcast and if you have feedback or suggestions, drop us a line at communications at ausveg.com.au. In this episode, Ausveg's National Manager of Public Affairs, Lucy Gregg, will take us through recent changes to workforce policy affecting growers, in particular the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme, known as PALM. We'll also be speaking with SP Singh from the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries about a new project looking into microbial contamination in leafy vegetables. And finally, we'll be talking about an innovative approach to potato marketing with the Spud Sisters, who we heard at the top of the show. And with that, let's turn to Lucy for the latest on the Palm Scheme. I'm here with Lucy Gregg, Ausveg's National Manager of Public Affairs. Lucy, there's been a lot happening with workforce policy in recent months, and most of it has been pretty bad news for vegetable growers. You've been burning a lot of shoe leather speaking with government to advocate for a more sensible approach. Can you take us through what the big changes have been to workforce legislation recently and what Ausveg is advocating for? Yeah, thanks, Tom. And it has been a very, very busy time uh, in relation to workplace relations. Uh, The government has introduced a a suite of changes uh, across several aspects. Um, which start, I guess, most importantly with the PALM scheme, with the new deed and guidelines, which has uh, a lot more onerous requirements on growers. Plus, we also have the uh, new requirement of 30 hours um, average over a week, um, which in many sectors will be very challenging for growers to manage. Um, On top of that, we have uh, changes to the TISMET threshold. Um, so for those growers which utilise the horticultural industry labour agreement, the increase of the TISMET to 70,000 will actually make a significant impact because the occupations that most growers are utilising under the horticultural industry labour agreement are for uh, occupations such as uh, forklift drivers and things like that. So um, the threshold's now quite high, which will um, put that out of the realms of of some people. Uh, We've also seen changes to the overseas student visas, which now sees overseas students with reduced working hours. Um, That has a significant impact on those growers which utilise overseas students, particularly um, in the more peri-urban areas which utilise these types of visas. Um, And additionally, we've seen the fees for backpackers change, increase significantly. And with the UK FTA, we now have uh, the removal of work requirements for visas for working holiday makers out of the UK. So whichever uh, labour pool that growers have been utilising, whether it be palm workers, backpackers, overseas students, um, there has been significant changes, which which is definitely impacting growers across all states and across all commodities. And looking at the changes to the palm scheme, uh, that's obviously a, a fairly significant change. Uh, when are they coming into effect? Well, the new deed and guidelines have been released um, and my understanding from the department is that majority of growers have signed their deed, um, which is probably more a case of having to. Um, I know there's uh, some concern about growers having to sign it, but they were um, in no position not, not to sign it. Um, we're monitoring the situation really closely. The workforce sentiment survey that we did uh, over July indicated that the changes to the deed and guidelines 
are having an impact on growers and it, the survey indicated that 20% of growers are looking at exiting the palm scheme or at least winding it back. Um, so we'll be monitoring that um, and certainly reporting that back to the federal government. And what's Ausveg pushing for at the moment? What's the what's the advocacy push? Look, we're uh, battling all fronts at the moment, I guess is, is the way to put it. Uh, the Workforce Sentiment Survey showed that 71% of growers currently have workforce shortages um, and we're not even in the peak of season. Uh, 47% of growers expected that it would worsen uh, in the coming few months um, and 47% thought it would be status quo. So that's still um, concerning going into into um, spring and summer. Um, so we need to keep uh, looking at options for growers. We'll keep advocating for uh, loosening the, st- the restrictions um, around the palm. We'll be fe- providing feedback um, from growers on the ground. Uh, of concern is the migration review and what that might bring in the future. Uh, there has been uh, significant conversations uh, around the fact that uh, the working uh, requirements for working holiday makers may be removed, uh, which would have once again a dramatic uh, impact on on growers. I think seventy two percent of growers utilise backpackers in their harvest labour. Um, so you know, any changes to that would would be compounded along with the changes to palm and and overseas students. So I think that's the problem is no matter which direction growers are turning to, the door's shutting. Um, and that's now reflected in you know thirty four percent of growers are considering exiting the industry over you know the next twelve months. Um, so we definitely need, the workplace environment to change um, because it's not sustainable putting growers under this substantial pressure. Um, and and the detriment is food security because talking to growers, some aren't planting crops because they know they may not have the labour to harvest them. Um, and that's obviously going to have long-term consequences on on food, food, not only food supply, but food pricing. Well, Lucy, thanks very much for the update. This is obviously still a developing issue, so growers can stay up to date with the Olds Veg Advocacy Update newsletter or by following us on social media, and major new developments we'll no doubt cover in future episodes of this podcast. You're listening to the Vegalog podcast brought to you by Ausveg. In 2025, a new food safety standard for leafy greens, melons and berries will be coming into effect. Developed by Food Standards Australia New Zealand, the new standard will tighten regulations for these crops. Helping growers prepare for that standard is one of the goals of a new levy-funded project. Identifying and managing sources and roots of microbial contamination in leafy vegetables is being run by the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, and I caught up with project lead Dr Sukhvinder Pal Singh, known to the industry as SP, at the recent Protected Cropping Australia conference in Brisbane. I'm speaking today with SP Singh from the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries about a new project looking into microbial contamination of leafy vegetables. So SP, this project is co-funded by the New South Wales DPI and Hood Innovation. Uh, to start off with, could you tell us the name of the project and what its genesis was? What's the, the need that this project is aiming to address? Uh, well, uh, this project is uh, aimed to identify the sources and roots of microbial contamination in the leafy veg industry. Uh, the project is, as you said, is funded by uh, vegetable growers R&D Levy uh, and, and the South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Uh, the genesis of this project is to uh, enhance the food safety systems of the industry uh, by providing them the best practice. Uh, we understand that uh, industry has been doing uh, a great job in managing food safety risks on farm and, and post harvest, uh, but we are further exploring the possibilities 
of uh, taking the food safety to next level. Uh, as the uh, leafy vegetable industry uh, will be coming under a new regulation, which is called the Primary Production and Processing Standard for Leafy Vegetables 4.2.8. This standard will be coming into effect from the 12th of February 2025. So we want to uh, look at uh, the leafy veg industry's uh, production as well as post-harvest systems to make sure that the industry uh, uh, successfully transitions in this new uh, uh, regulatory phase. So if this project is towards uh, preparedness uh, of the industry uh, in, this, in this new era that's, that we are foreseeing. So am I right in saying the, this new project is, is less about uh, understanding the mechanisms behind the microbial contamination of leafy veg and more about where in the supply chain that's happening? Uh, that's right. In this project, we are looking at the whole of supply chain. So we are starting from the farms. So we, are, we will be looking at the production systems. We will be looking at the inputs that growers use in, in, in a variety of production systems. And also we will be looking at what are those potential sources and, and routes of contamination that are currently uh, uh, unaddressed. So we are looking for um, uh, what are those pathogens, like what, which pathogen is a major concern. So we are looking at a range of pathogens like Salmonella, Listeria monocytogenes, and sugar toxin E. coli. So currently we do not understand what is the nature and the magnitude of risk. So this project is looking at um, to how best we can define uh, where those risks are and what, what is their uh, uh, magnitude. So once we know the sources and roots of uh, those microbial contaminants, uh, we can address them. So in this project, uh, we are using the latest technology in pathogen identification and whole genome sequencing to join the dots of where those pathogens are sitting and how do they transmit in the production system as well as in the post-harvest processing. So in a nutshell, this project is uh, uh, aiming to explore uh, the diversity of those pathogens and how do they uh, travel and cause contamination of, of leafy veg in the field as well as the post-harvest processing systems. And are there some typical causes of contamination or points in the supply chain that you're going to be focusing on in particular? In this project, as I said, it's whole of the supply chain. We'll be looking at on-farm, post-harvest processing centers, and then we'll be also looking at the retail end of, of the supply chain. Particularly on-farm, we are interested in uh, two major inputs, which are agricultural water and soil amendments. So we'll be focusing more on agricultural water and soil amendments on-farm, and then we'll be also looking at post-harvest processing, how these products are washed, sanitized, and handled. So we'll be looking at those major uh, hotspots for contamination and cross-contamination, which are of concern. So as we understand, um, the industry has a whole range of food safety schemes in place. So, but we are going, as I said, to the next level where we would like to uh, look at various case studies uh, to manage those risks. And all that um, work will be presented to the industry um, in order to, to bring some uh, positive changes so that we address that risk uh, more effectively. Fantastic, and I, I understand uh, you mentioned uh, one of the goals of the project is to prepare the industry for this, this new standard. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, where that standard has come from, who's developed it, and uh, what, what it's all about, what the goal of that standard is. So this standard is developed by uh, Food Standards Australia New Zealand. It's the federal agency which, which develops standards. Uh, once the standard is developed, then it is a responsibility of the state uh, food or health agencies to, to enforce that standard. So this standard uh, has been developed um, to further improve the food safety uh, in the industry. Uh, the argument that FISAN, which is Food Standards Australia New Zealand has, 
uh, that uh, there have been few incidents in the recent past uh, within Australia and globally uh, that, that led to the development of this new standard. So this new standard uh, means uh, uh, all leafy vegetables um, which are grown uh, and processed in Australia, they will be covered. So the definition of leafy veg for this standard is uh, any vegetable of leafy nature, which is green and is eaten raw, is leafy vegetable. So it covers a whole range of leafy veg commodities in this standard, for example, all types of lettuces, spinach, um, and herbs, for example, parsley, basil, mint, uh, cabbage, uh, spring onion, kale, uh, chards, uh, Asian vegetables. So it's a whole range of uh, leafy veg commodities uh, which are covered in this standard. And the information is available on Food Standards Australia New Zealand website. And through our new project, we will be sending and the information to the industry through uh, Oswich communication program and we will be providing more information on the commodities which are addressed um, in that standard. In addition to primary production, the standard also applies to processing of these standards. Processing, which means if we are trimming, sorting, washing, sanitizing, that is all considered processing. So whether a grower is uh, doing this post-harvest processing on site, um, even if they are trimming the produce or just doing minor sorting, it's considered processing. So, so this standard will apply to both primary production and processing of leafy vegetables. And I, I understand you're hoping to work quite closely with, with industry on, on this project. Uh, what kind of input are you looking for from growers? We are contacting growers to come forward and participate in the project. So in this project, as I said, we are collecting uh, data from the industry, uh, looking at the current industry practice, which will help us to benchmark uh, where the industry is at present. Once we do that exercise, we will develop a national snapshot of industry practice, which will help us in identifying uh, those areas where we need immediate intervention. And combined with this, we are collecting microbiological samples from, from farms, which include samples of soil and water and produce. Um, so once we do the microbiological analysis of these samples, we will find out where are those pathogens and what is their nature and, and, and how, how they get transmitted in the system. So we are encouraging growers to come forward and participate in the project and let the team come to their farm, look at their practice, and we would like to collect the microbiological samples and we will provide the information and, and the report uh, in full confidentiality to the grower. So we are really looking forward uh, to growers coming uh, on board this project. So far, uh, we have very encouraging um, uh, response from the industry and we have signed up more than 10 growers from Western Australia, South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria. So it's my appeal to growers that please come forward um, uh, and join this project. We, we respect your privacy and confidentiality in terms of food safety. We understand that and we, we assure that, that will be, uh, all the data and, and information will be presented uh, anonymously. So yes, yeah, so it's, so it's, it's great if you can come on board. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like a project anyone in leafy veg should be following with close interest. Uh, thank you very much for speaking with me, SB. Thanks, Tom. This project was funded by Horde Innovation using the Vegetable Levy and contributions from the Australian Government under project code VG22002. Well, it may surprise you to know that there are well over 5,000 varieties of potatoes around the world. While most consumers might only be able to name a couple, there are some passionate potato patrons out there who are looking for something specific, something special. Those buyers can thankfully turn to suppliers like Spud Sisters, a Victorian grower and marketer of specialty potato varieties. Ausveg's Deborah Hill spoke with the Spud Sisters themselves, Kerry and Catherine, about their evolution from a traditional family-owned potato grower to a consumer direct marketer growing and selling a vast range of specialist spuds. 
Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us this morning. Um, on my, <laughs> I'd like to introduce um, the Spud sisters. This is Kerry and Catherine. They're both from Ballarat District originally, uh, third generation farming, yep. I believe. Yes. So we're now in your warehouse in Moorabbin in Melbourne, surrounded by beautiful varieties of potatoes. Mm -hmm. What's the journey for you between girls growing up in Ballarat District as mm -hmm. daughters of Spud farmers to being the Spud sisters? <laughs> Well, it's been it's been quite a journey, actually. I think it's like coming growing up in Ballarat. You leave, or some people do leave, uh, if they've got higher aspirations. Um, so we would have worked and done a few odd jobs in Ballarat, and then decided that we would go off to Melbourne to to you know further our careers. But underlying all of that is a wealth of knowledge from potatoes, which so you never really kind of you know you can take the country out of the take girls the girl out, out of the, the country, country but that's not it. the country out of the way. It's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly how <laughs> I should have said it. Um, so our dad um, was the son of a potato farmer who also was interested in dairy. Mm. So he he had there were two brothers and one brother decided to go more the dairy side and became one of the first dairies in Ballarat and then my dad decided to go and pick up the, the potato side of it so mm -hmm. then from there um, he has progressed all the way through growing, selling, seasonal picking. He would have a team of uh, potato pickers that would go through farms and help them um, pick potatoes and us girls would often have to go down and cook meals for them or you know <laughs> you know travel around <laughs> so we were part of part of all that that side of it uh, but we always were interested and you, you absorb things you know from when you were young um, about all kinds of things and might, you might go off to the country but you still have got a great understanding so when we all started having children and babies in Melbourne dad brought down the first uh, load of potatoes um, well, he would often come through to drop them off at fish and chip shops or whatever, and he said to me, um, "Take these, take these to the girls around in the kinder. Care, okay? they'd love these spuds. They're beautiful spuds." And I thought, "Oh, it's just the girls are going to really like these dad? dirty old spuds, <laughs> really, really right. Dad? You know, because that was not something that you know kind of triggered. But actually, I did. I did. I took them around, and we sent a, set up a little flyer. And um, when my so thirty two odd thirty thirty three odd years ago now. Um, and from there it started really so people ordered then I, I did a letterbox drop and pushed the pram and and then you know went down the street and then delivered them and then some years later Catherine and I gone you Catherine and I got well, together well Catherine was well, sick of what she was doing and thought yeah. she wanted to change well, and Kerry said to me that she could see real potential in the business mm -hmm. and there was real growth she could see that so I was in a full-time job and wanted a little bit of a change so I approached my boss and um, we agreed that I could work part-time so I worked three three days in the city and two days with Kerry mm. and that's when Spud Sisters mm. was formed. Well, yeah so the actual name came from there but we'd kind of been fiddling with potatoes you know I think I realised we both realised that if you take potatoes um, to a restaurant and they're inquiring about them and they they're realizing the freshness of them so they're not being cool stored and then we've started to gather knowledge from that feedback from mm. from talking to chefs from um, from from farmers markets where we would straight up get you know you get your feedback straight away from a farmers market and and that's really good you can help to guide what that potato is doing whether it's yeah. starting to turn in its sugars when it's a fluffy flowery starchy potato you want it to be stable for restaurants and you, you, you get to pick up pretty quickly when it's getting a bit older and the starches are turning and it's yeah. browning off and it's cooking that bit sweeter and it, almost before the restaurants will tell us we've kind of got a bit of a handle on it. Yeah. I guess then education for hospitality and even the, the other families through schools and so on yeah. in the very early days, education would have been a major part of yeah, absolutely. Selling, selling the potato, if you like. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we want more people to know about potatoes and yeah. understand mm. potatoes. And that's one of the lovely things at the farmers markets.
and talking to chefs mm. um, where we um, get direct feedback as, uh, and get a real understanding of mm. uh, we understand the difference between the floury potatoes and the waxy potatoes mm. yeah. and able to talk to our customers. Mm. And I think we've kind of realised that 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 great need between understanding because a lot of chefs will say to you oh I need something waxy when they really mean flowery because they've they've been kind of picked up the wrong signals along the way and they don't have always a great understanding there are some that do but in there would be quite a few that don't yeah. that are you know how would you describe then to someone who's completely oblivious to those terms what the differences are between a, a waxy one a flowery one or mm -hmm. one that's got low sugars and is better for yep XYZ. Yeah, absolutely. So a perfect example is if a, uh, a, a someone would come up at a farmer's market or a chef would say to us, we really need a, I want a potato for to make a beautiful soup. What kind of a, you know, what kind of potato would you recommend out of all of these? And then we would have to ask them, well, do you want to make a, a potato and leek soup or do you want to make a, 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 a minestrone soup or, or a chunky vegetable soup? Mm. And straight away, people kind of understand, okay, what, there's a difference. What, what's the difference? So then the difference is the waxy potato um, is full. It's, it's more um, concentrated in water, in moisture. So it doesn't absorb it when it's mm -hmm. cooking. So it's waxy if you can kind of... And that waxier potato is creamier. It makes a creamier mash. It makes... Um, uh, it's easier to... Um, go on. Yeah, okay. it will hold in its piece. Thanks, yeah. Kate. So for the minestrone, down. the max waxy one is a better option because Correct. it'll keep its shape. shape Whereas for the potato and leek soup, you want it to actually... You want it to break down. To you break want down. it to break down yeah. easy and to blend and be smoother. Yes. And those potatoes are better... They're, they're, they're a, co a potato that cooks quicker for roasting and for yes. uh, for frying in particular. But if you make a potato and leek soup with a waxy potato, it will often go gluey. Yeah. And you yeah. can't make a potato and leek soup with a potato that breaks down so it goes mashy. And the same with a same with um, potatoes. At the moment, we've got a lot of restaurants um, that w um, have got different kinds of mash. So if you have a, f a floury potato, the Andean Sunrise or the Yukon Gold or even the Blackwood Gold, it absorbs the butter. Mm. So that's what gives us this rich, buttery kind of a feeling. Right. But you have to be really careful that you don't overboil it because if you do, it can break down. So it's just that little point of having being gentle with it. Sometimes you might steam it, but it makes a fabulous fluffy mash. It's beautiful. And mm. then your, your Nicola or your Dutch cream or your will wash will make that creamier mash and you might yes. not necessarily have to put so much butter with it but it's firmer so it's a it depends there on what they subtle differences and between, then what yeah. ha, what they want it to look like on the plate are there different flavor profiles with them as well absolutely every potato on this table has its own flavor yes. so we talked about Nicola's and we talked about Sebago's which are not PBR breeds or no. anything like that yep. what are some of the other breeds that you've got here the um, varieties here that are that are really kind of taking private. off, I guess. Yeah, well, um, th we haven't got the Andean Sunrise with us, but um, Gordon Jones uh, is growing those from uh, Graham Liney, so they would have a, a privatisation. But they, uh, they've been a wet paddock. He hasn't been able to get onto them. <laughs> so I haven't been able to, to get any for you, unfortunately. But they are kind of of that style of that Peruvian potato. Um, there are some coming from Tasmania that are called... Peruvian Gold and Mayan Twilight. They're another deep yellow flesh potato that the restaurants are really loving at the moment. And they're um, being, I think it's being encouraged by lots of international chefs. We have got um, such a lovely melting pot in Melbourne of different yeah. you know, Brazilian, Spanish so chefs. How did you get your foot in the door with hospitality yeah. then? <laughs> well, that was... I think just grew organically organic. from going door to door, really, and knocking yep. on doors. Yep, and, and, and getting in front of people. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. really how you have to do it, isn't it? Yeah. It is because you need to. This is what I would um, say for anyone that wanted to go down the road of of putting different rows of different kind of potatoes in. That if you can. Um, before you decide to go too far down that track and you, your, your sample batches that's coming up, take them to a restaurant, take yes. them to a few people because some will be better than others and it's no good planting out a row if it's not going to take off. You need that market in place mm. pretty much before you get going. Yeah, or at least you yeah. know the, you need to know the knowledge of whether it's waxy or flowery so that yeah. you can then pitch that yeah. to the restaurants. And it's not hard to get restaurants on, on board. We, we supply to a lot of really high-end restaurants. And I guess they're all chefs. looking for 
a niche in themselves, aren't they? A they point are. of difference between the other yeah. high-end restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they bounce off one another too. You know, they'll kind of talk to one another, and um, and there'll be different. Like um, Jacques Ramon's restaurants, one of his restaurants will they'll have the same potato, but the chef will do it a different way. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's just experimenting. And them understanding and knowing that there is this variety out there and it doesn't have to be just that one generic... Uh, well, the trend was for Kipflers on everything, wasn't it, for a yeah. long time? Yeah. And Desiree yeah. as well yes. is very popular, mm. isn't it, mm. in amongst a lot of mm. places and restaurants. But mm. there are, we think there are more, you know, nicer There's so varieties much nicer varieties than Desiree. Desiree. In terms of then developing which varieties to take to farmers markets and hospitality mm. how far in advance do you look at doing that and do you work with growers I'm assuming you yeah you're not doing all of it at, up in Ballarat no District. no we work with a lot of growers um the, from from uh, from our district from around the Ballarat is the Dunsist and the uh, Trentham all in around there then there's uh, Gippsland then there's um, the Hawks farm down on the peninsula uh, and and other farms in and around because they they don't get frosts down there so you have to actually have this little patchwork the only time it's really really tricky um, and Catherine and I have to be on our toes is in uh, December November December January when the st starchy potatoes because starchy potatoes is what mostly the industry is after right. crispy crunchy frying potatoes because they're the most problematic when they turn, when their sugars turn. So you have to have that uh, that kind of a network, and Catherine and I have kind of built a little patchwork of dovetailing in so that when varieties finish around the, the You've state... You've got that consistency of supply that's right, across we've got that the, little the flow. season, yeah. continuity. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. And also, you know, trusting the, the farmers that you grow. We've built a lot of trust and respect between, you know, agron really good agronomists and really mm -hmm. good farmers that have put in... Um, the the potatoes and you know will look after us and will kind of do their best and that I think is that having that background of farming helps helps you know you, you it helps to be able to understand what they're going through yeah. you know when they say that there's you know, rain they'll have to get home to do <laughs> out they'll have to you, you understand you can't, can't plant this week because of that's the right too wet. that's right yeah. I can't get those everyone screaming out for the last of the Andean sunrise it can't get you can't swim and get them you know you've got to <laughs> wait till a tractor can get onto the to the land so that going back to the chefs is really valuable yes <clears throat> and yeah. it's also nice to work with some smaller farms yeah. that are yeah. happy to put in mm. some different varieties yeah. to try mm. Mm. to see they'll give they... it a crack I'll give them is a the go. provenance of where the potato has come from become part of that story now like it's come from the Mornington Peninsula it's a mm. I'm guessing quickly here yeah. uh, Dutch cream from Mornington Peninsula yeah. and you yes. know those kind yeah. of stories are they part of the I think they are yeah they like the to dish? certainly a lot of local potatoes you know people will want to know where it's from or and we, we supply restaurants that just do a particular um, area a particular you know f um, farmers daughters Gippsland farmers daughters Victoria so making sure right, that yes. the produce that you put into their restaurants is from Gippsland is from you know yeah. so that's that um, that authenticity is kind of followed through, um, and and uh, and and I think also chefs really do appreciate that uh, information that you can give them about that um, you know what's coming up. We, we've got a planting break. I'll have to put another potato in. I'll give you a couple of different varieties to try. Yeah. Then what's your your first, your second, your third potato so that we've kind of got something. You, know, so you, you work with a number of farmers, but mm. for these more niche, rarer varieties, mm. seed potatoes and, and the tubers becomes the next mm. issue, doesn't it, for yeah. those those guys? Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. So so they'll come from different parts, of, from Tasmania or from, you know, our district is quite a lot of, of seed that comes out of it, but it generally is the... Um, the, the, the in, in a, Yeah, that's right. That's all those sort of starchy ones. But, you know, farmers, the, the trying, they're trying to actually to accommodate this little uh, surge that's coming up through the restaurants and to be able to try different... Yes, they'll get seed, like, from South Australia, which is our Lily Rose that's coming across. It's a He's a seed farmer, so he wants to be able to try yeah. to foster that and build that. Yeah. Um, Nigel Crump, he will put uh, mini tubers in and... Um, uh, uh, one of the McConnell boys is going to put 
pink fur apple in for me. So mm. it's it's planning ahead so that right. you know that I know that pink fur has has taken off a bit. So you have to have a succession. So yes. you know, in two years we'll have some that. We're... Do some of these more niche varieties also have smaller shelf life? Mm -hmm. Yep, um, some some of them, not all of them. Uh, that the Andean sunrise. Yeah. So the Andean you've got sun. To be a bit careful with those. Yeah. So that Andean sunrise has got um, it's. A beautiful potato, but it's very problematic to yes. grow. So it can't be stored. It's got to be picked fresh and okay. used fresh. You can't yeah. kind of leave it in the in the shed. You can't, you know, bring out, um, you know, your two or three rows and put them in the shed yeah. and, and wait to get through them in about two or three weeks. They've really got to be so dug. Contracts for that one in particular. Yeah, that's right. You yeah. grow and to contract, and once it's gone, it's gone. That's right, exactly. Yeah. And also understanding the quirks of it. The the longer that you have it in the ground, to kind of work out, oh, was it the cool storage that made it turn, or was it this and tweaking? The ground too long. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's right. So maybe the ground was too cold. So it's also yeah. understand. It's 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 worthwhile pursuing though with a problematic potato, even though mm. sometimes farmers will say, you know, why bother? Yeah. Because you but, really can yeah. charge, you can actually you get, can get more. That premium you don't have to it. put as many in and you can get, you know, mm. twice as much, you know, three sure. times as much. Sure. You can, you can, you know, tweak your work with, with your suppliers that if, um, rest, if they are a bit unique, there is a market for them. Mm. Okay. Mm. From an Agronomy 101 point of view, are there any significant differences with the different varieties on how they're grown? Like most of them would be in acidic soil, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think it's really, um, I think all of the potatoes that we've got here uh, haven't been too problematic, apart from perhaps the Andean Sunrise. I think they've all really been, you know, they'll all have their own little quirks, but in, you know, like your Sabagos and your Blue Moons and all those kind of ones that, that are pretty easy to to grow. I think they're, they're, they're there's not, not really so much a, a, a problem that we, some that one of the farms might say to you, oh, like the Telangi delights, they've got a very, very light skin. The, um, so when they're coming over the, the grader, they could damage their skins a little bit. Which can Pontiac. lead to that's right. well, you've, and infections and whatnot. That's in exactly right. Itself, so, yeah. And you have to kind of use them. They can't store them too well. Pontiacs are fabulous potatoes. They're much nicer than a Desiree, but they've got very deep eyes, and so peeling them can be a bit of a pain if you want to take them to a restaurant. So, yes. so you you know you have to have a bit of a trade off with one and the other. But some potatoes do you have to use different. Um, old, some farms, some old school farms have uh, the leather belts. They come out and they don't actually come on the rollers, so they gently come out and yes. they don't yeah. damage the potatoes so much more. Diseases John, are, are some better at resisting disease and, and infections and mm. that kind of thing like the, the they keep tweaking as you know potatoes mm. like your sabago is being um just a little bit of a tweak which would be your gatsby so that that stays ahead of all of any of yeah. the kind of diseases that might be in it so your gatsby is very 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 close to a, a sabago but um you know there's some, some varieties it you wouldn't be able to tweak better tolerance to that particular that's exactly right so you know right. if it's got you know silver scurf or it's got some kind of a um some little blemishes that might be on it, um, dry rot, etc., etc. Yeah. Sometimes the Pontiac's a bit more prevalent to dry rot, but yeah. Um, but yeah, there'll always be something that you've got to just kind of tweak your your varieties, and that's where I think that's where sometimes there are too many varieties to kind of get your head around. <laughs> if you kind of then follow that principle of flowery, all rounder, waxy then you can kind of fit potatoes into that belt. Yeah. You can have a restaurant yeah. that has a one, two, three, what variety they prefer. <laughs> but at the farmer's market and this growing wealth and also, you know, the the, the restaurants too, understanding really that that there is this diverse uh, diversity of potatoes and they are all different mm. um, is part of the charm of it all. That's how they should look. <laughs> and we like... Uh, when we open boxes, we mm. find some really kooky shaped <laughs> potatoes and we absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we put them out on display at the farmer's <laughs> markets and ask the kids, yeah. what do you think that looks like? <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you both, Kerry and Catherine, for joining us today at Ellsveg to have a chat with you about 
the quirkiness of yeah. potatoes. <laughs> like, yeah, so it's All these beautiful varieties. It's been a real pleasure with you. Uh, absolute pleasure. And uh, thanks so much for showing an interest, really, because I think yeah. um, it is... There it is, is more to potatoes there's than far meets more the eye. To, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the potato eye. I agree. I agree. <laughs> thanks. Lots of eyes. Yes. Thank you all. <laughs> thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>